November's NFL topic, if resolved, direct popular vote should replace electoral vote in the United States presidential election. Overall, this is probably a pretty good, pretty balanced topic with a lot of arguments both sides have access to it. We use literature on for both sides. More importantly, both sides have access to a lot of similar evidence that talks about the other side's evidence and a lot of turns to each side's argument. This is one of those rare topics where I feel whichever team actually does the better debating is pretty likely to win regardless of which side they are. Also, it's a good topic in that because the clash is fairly direct and turns are fairly plentiful, you're not going to run into a situation where you need to see class and need to see first to win, and the advantages of both sides are fairly even. So personal preference and the quality of evidence your team finds is going to be determining this here. It's not a be pro and second or lose kind of topic. Anyhow, I'm just going to break down a few of the arguments. The topic itself is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. When it talks about direct popular vote, just whoever wins the most people in the country wins. It has coincided with electoral vote in nearly every election in the U.S., with three exceptions, two of which came down to the Supreme Court, one of which came down to a compromise. Overall, there's not too much difference there, but there's constantly talk about change. There are two main reasons the Electoral College was adopted in the first place. The first, the states had a lot more autonomy back then and were largely like small countries unto themselves. The president was the executive of the states who the people in those states. The chief executives were, and you mean today, their governors. So that's one big difference. The other difference, aside from that, is just that it would be impossible actually to count everybody's vote back in the 1790s, whereas today with computerized voting, that obstacle is no longer in place. There may have been other motives behind the Electoral College originally, but we'll talk about those when we talk to the different sides of argument. So I'm just going to start off with just a general idea of the balance on the topic. I think overall, Khan has a little bit easier time. These are the top ten arguments for each side. I think Khan's arguments would be a little bit better, just because Pro has a hard time quantifying them, it's only a need for the status quo to change. All the reasons Pro has a thing to make it better are very hypothetical with very few empirics behind them. Whereas Khan can really say, look, the system isn't that big. Your dire need to change is only a risk things could get worse. So overall, I think Khan probably has a better diversity of points. Pro has a lot of points that sound very good at first and lend themselves to good rhetoric, but aren't exactly that easy to weigh the impact of against Khan. Again, it doesn't matter too much because this debate is going to be won on terms by both sides and the other side's arguments, rather than just the merits of one's own case, as long as one's familiar with both sides of the literature. But Pro also has two very strong arguments that are probably stronger than any of Khan's and necessitate some kind of response. So just going to look at the arguments in turn. The first Pro argument is probably the most intuitive one, direct democracy. Just the idea that people should be able to have everybody's vote counted. It's not that your vote shouldn't matter either because your state is automatically going in that direction or your state is automatically going in the direction you didn't vote, and either of those don't help you. We have a couple swing states, and that every election comes down to who wins Ohio or who wins Florida or who wins Pennsylvania makes the rest of the states largely irrelevant and that every vote ought to count. So those are the basis of a lot of common pro arguments. They'll talk about how this affects the two-party system, how this affects voter turnout, how this affects primaries, and I'll talk about those more up for a second category of arguments that's up for grabs for anybody. The last two exclusively pro arguments I want to talk about are the idea of a racial bias and the idea that status quo is not purely electoral votes. So I'll talk about the idea of the racial bias first. One of the things the Electoral College did was it gave the South to vote for their slave population without allowing the slaves to vote. The three-fifths compromise wasn't just about Senate, rep Senate representation proportional, it also had to do with the Electoral College. So Southern states got a lot of electoral votes for their slaves, which they wouldn't have actually wanted if they had to let the slaves vote to get them, but it let them vote on behalf of their slaves. Obviously today, because of various amended civil rights movements, civil war, that has changed a lot. But even despite the Voting Rights Act, a lot of people say that there is still a bias that the Electoral College creates towards largely rural white states 
more votes per person, whereas heavily urban states or states with large minority populations often get less bias per person, often get less votes per person. And what that actually does is, even if it wasn't intended that way, we entrenches the institutional racism that was around when the Electoral College was created. One of the easy ways Alcro has when weighing arguments is besides just talking about that, mentioning that worst case, theirs doesn't give any one person more or less voice than another, it makes the voices very even. The second thing that Pro can talk about that kind of has a difficult time answering is the status quo is not just the electoral college. The status quo is some states deciding they want to assign their votes proportionally by population and splitting them instead of winner case all, or the other states are forming interstate compacts to split all those states' votes according to this idea of whatever the popular vote is in those states, the combined electoral votes of those states should be split in whatever most accurately reflects that practice. The trouble with that is it's probably worse of both worlds to have some states that are popular vote and some states that are electoral vote, as any politician with half a brain who wants to win an election is going to focus on these states where winning them wouldn't be the whole state, and these can have with winning maybe a half, maybe a quarter of the other states. It also allows for nightmare scenarios in elections where politicians could win a quarter of the country and still win presidency. So those are some arguments that are strong for growth. Khan's arguments are a little bit more practical. A lot are grounded in the idea of federalism that the state and federal governments are two-tiered, very different. The president has very little influence over any one person's daily life. Rather, your governor makes most of the decisions that would actually affect what's going on in a state. There are many things that governments do in states that the president simply can't interfere in. A recent example would be capital punishment in Texas. However, the idea that the president isn't supposed to be the chief executive of the people, supposed to be chief executive of the state, and represent the state, is a the majority of states should have to accept the president and not just the majority of people. They have to be acceptable all around the country, not just on the very populated east and west coasts. So aside from that, there's also procedural practical issues that the con side can bring up. For instance, an election that comes down to popular vote could be subject to endless recounts, could be challenged in many different ways, would be more likely to be contested, and would make groups feel more marginalized if they're on the losing side. So those are all other arguments that Khan can make. Aside from that, another thing that Khan can talk about is just there really isn't too much difference. The Electoral College is actually a fairly accurate representation. For instance, in 2004, the crucial battleground state was Ohio. The vote split about 48.9% for Bush and slightly less than that for Harris. In Ohio, the vote was 48.8% for and slightly less than that for Harry. So in both cases, it was very close to very proportion. There wasn't too much of a difference in what that actually did. So even if the Electoral College could be abused, it isn't being abused. The most important hypothetical impact will happen because it's currently an accurate representation of the country as a whole. Aside from that, Khan can also argue it will keep many other states relevant that other people wouldn't care about. States with low populations but large areas that may have large contributions to the country but would be ignored otherwise. So take, for instance, states such as Oklahoma, states such as Wyoming, which have very low populations and nobody would care enough to campaign in because they could be more conservative campaigning in large states and more accurately, large cities. So those are some of the things that Khan can talk about on this topic. Then there's a bunch of arguments that I don't really want to classify as pro war kind of arguments, but they're just arguments that are up for grants. For instance, urban versus rural. The Electoral College creates a rural bias. The absence of one might create an urban bias. I guess I can argue one of these good. A rural bias is probably more in tune with the founder's intent and is responsible to certain policies we have, such as farm subsidies and biofuels. Those could be argued to be good or bad by either side. As far as the urban bias, again, that can tie in to the racial bias, and the, the origins of the electoral college are obviously and have changed. We can also make an economic argument on pro the urban bias. The countries whose economic policies focus primarily on urban areas are growing, while all those but the U.S. that focus on rural areas are shrinking. 
primary system. Obviously, Khan's going to argue the primary system is actually good as is, so it could argue as long as they keep it directly linked to the resolution, that the primary system is bad, and that direct popular vote where anybody could vote for any candidate would get around the primary system. Voter turnout is another one of the programs by both sides. Khan could argue that it's not going to change very much, it might increase. Perfect argument is probably going to increase. Most people will feel their vote counts more. There are empirical examples of other countries that I would like to argue are aren't relevant on that. Another one that suggests both sides is campaign focus. Where will campaigns focus on? Will they split their attention more? Will they focus on bigger areas? Will they take issues that only a couple states care about? Or will they take issues that are more about the whole country? There's certainly a lot that either side can talk about with that. Lastly, the entire two-party system is also going to be tied into this topic. A lot of proteins are probably going to argue that the two-party system is obstructionist and myopic. A lot of conscience is going to argue the two-party system is absolutely crucial to the idea of compromise. And that without that, you would have even less compromise going on than you do in the government right now. Unlike most of the status quo impact, this is one where pro actually has a lot to gain and Khan doesn't have too much to lose, so it flips around a lot of the others about this being harmful to democracy, which is creating a lot of elections that are chosen in a different way. Again, whichever side can better follow the other side's arguments, turn them for their own, supply empirical examples, understand their history, and spin their evidence against the other side's evidence, is probably likely to remember to win. I think this will be a pretty painful topic to face for a whole year or for a month. It is probably a pretty solid topic. Enjoy the topic. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave me a message or a comment, and I'll try to elaborate in any follow-up that you may need. Hope this helps.